The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany is from Exodus chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people? from every other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. And the epistle is from Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, and he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. We rise to honor our God in the hearing of this gospel. <laughs> Then he said to them, 
Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We confess together this morning our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things remain, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, 
mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Next our message this morning comes from our Old Testament lesson. Moses said to God, Please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy. These are the words of God we will meditate upon this morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Moses can be described in a lot of different ways, looking at the different things that go on in his life. But one of my favorite words to use to describe Moses is what's good Yiddish word. A dictionary definition of chutzpah means to have nerve, maybe even to the point of audacity, insolence. And I like to put a little bit more of a positive spin on that word, especially when it comes to Moses. It means willing to do what others are not willing to do. Now, previously, uh, before our reading today, the Israelites had come out of Egypt, out of slavery. They had come to Mount Sinai, and God had descended upon the mountain. In all of his fiery glory and, and, and sound and rage and everything, and the people of God looked up at the mountain and said, I ain't going up there. Uh, Moses, you go. And Moses went. Takes a little bit of looks to do that. Now, after all of this is done, the people have received God's word, and God says, we're heading off to the promised land. He says, now you've got to leave. You've got to go from Sinai and go to that place where I am sending you. And after all the powerful miracles that God had displayed in Egypt as he worked through those plains to get his people free, and after Moses himself had gone up onto the mountain and he had spoken with God, and God had spoken to him as if they were best friends, it now seems like in our reading today that Moses is harboring some doubts. Now isn't he so much like us in that harboring doubts? I mean, we've seen great miracles, haven't we? We've seen people raised from the dead right there at the baptismal font. We have seen Christ's very presence in the Holy Supper, right there. We constantly see God's miracles here in word and sacrament, and you've seen God's miracles in your own life. The greatest miracle, of course, is bringing you to faith. We get to speak to God directly by prayer. God speaks to us as if we are his friends through his word. But don't we still have doubt? We still have failings of faith. Moses' problem now seems that he doesn't really know what's going to happen. He's not really sure if God is going to continue to go with them on this journey to the promised land. He said, see, you say to me, God, bring these people, but you haven't even let me know who you're going to have go with us. Moses there so much like you and me. Even though God has demonstrated his love, his power, his grace, and his mercy time and time again toward us in the past, we have doubts. We face some new trial, some new tribulation, some new challenge in our lives, and we wonder, God, are you still going to go with me? Are you still going to walk with me where it is you are sending me? As we walk on through this life, as we walk on to our eternal homes in heaven and in the new creation. So we have those same doubts as Moses did. Are you going with us? That's Moses' football coming out again. He starts asking God now, for assurances. So let's look at Moses' request for assurances today and see what we can learn from them and how much it is so much like you and me every day. Moses 
first request of God is this. If I have found favor in your sight, they show me now your ways. We talked about this in Bible study today. We begin with that beautiful word, favor. It's a Hebrew word, means that's pronounced ken. I held that back a little bit so I didn't spit up. But that Hebrew word means approval, affection. It's related to that New Testament word in Greek that we translate as grace. But Moses says, if. Moses says, if, regarding, do I really have God's favor? He's essentially asking God at this point, God, do you really love me? <clears throat> God, do I really have your favor? God, do I really have your grace? And we look at Moses and we say, Moses, how can you possibly question that? Looking at what God has done in your life. You were saved in that basket as a baby. You were brought into Pharaoh's own home. You lived 40 years out in the wilderness in Midian. You came back and God used you through all of his powers to rescue the people of Israel. How can you possibly doubt whether God loves you, Moses, and God's favor. How could he possibly doubt whether God's favor, his grace, was toward him? God's favor, God's grace, had nothing to do with Moses personally. But the Bible yet says that God was pleased with Moses. At the burning bush, God had asked Moses, told Moses, go, you're going to do this work for me. And Moses came up with every excuse he possibly could, finally ending up with, I'm no public speaker. And God says, I don't care. I'm using you as my voice. You're going to go. And you're going to say what I have to say. It doesn't matter if you're a good speaker or not. You're going to have my words. But he goes back, I, I, I stutter. Or whatever his verbal problem was, even though it says God was angry with Moses, he says, Moses, I'll give you your older brother Aaron. He'll be your spokesman as you are my spokesman. How can you doubt my love, my grace towards you, Moses? What was God's gracious answer to Moses when Moses said, do I have your favor? God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. God's answer to Moses' doubt about God's love, about God's grace toward him, was the sure promise of God's presence and the gift of God's peace. Do you ever doubt God's grace and love toward you like Moses did? Have you ever felt unworthy like Moses did, of God's grace. Well, let me tell you a very blatant truth. You're not worthy. You're absolutely not worthy of God's grace because of anything you do. We're sinners. We have never done anything on our own, by our own merit, by our own work, that gets one bit of God's love and faith. But, Second, far more wonderfully, God's love and grace has nothing to do with you. God is pleased with you for Jesus' sake. In your baptism, you were united to Jesus Christ in his life and in his death. His death on the cross was your death of your sin once and for all. His resurrection to life was your new life now and into all eternity. Because you are a baptized child of God, God says to you, this is my son. This is my daughter whom I love, with whom I am well Despite God's boundless demonstrations to 
us in the past with his grace, and his mercy, and his care toward us. His answer to our lingering and, yes, sinful doubts about the future, about his continued care for us, is the exact same answer that he gave to Moses. My presence will go with you. I will give you rest. God was present with the Israelites and with Moses on their journey in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. You have it so much better. God is present within you. For the Spirit of God dwells within you as a baptized child of God. The Israelites and Moses received rest when they received their relief from slavery and the Pharaoh and their ultimate rest in the promised land. You received something so much better. You have received God's rest in the release of your slavery from sin. The rest he gives you by his presence every day. The rest you will have in heaven and the rest you will have as and after the resurrection in the new creation. Our rest is now through his protective presence and through his word in which we receive that peace. That passes all of understanding. You have God's presence. You have God's peace. You have God's rest. Now, all eternity. Dealing with that first insecurity, now Moses goes to his second request before God. Please show me your glory. Despite God's promise of his presence. Despite God's promise of his rest, Moses still wants more assurance. It's like he was saying, yeah, God, I saw it. I saw all of those marvelous miracles you did back in Egypt, but I want more. If I to go on that long walk ahead that you say I need to go on, even if it is with you, I want to see your glory. What I need now, God, is something spectacular from you. Again, does not that sound so much like us and other Christians? I know I have the Lord. I know I have the sacraments. I know I have all this churchy stuff. But what I really want what I think I really need is something to show. I need something spectacular, Lord. Moses and us in our weakness ask to see God's glory. And what does God answer to both? I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Moses asked to see God's glory when God told him he would send his goodness. God would proclaim his name and not put on a show. God would reveal more of his divine character by doing that than showing his glorious appearance. People, we, we want, we think, we need something spectacular to go on. God, give me a sign. Make it clear, because I'm pretty stupid. Show me something spectacular. This, this is boring. i got to find something better that will wind me up on a Sunday morning. People want that. They think they need that to go on. But what do we, what do people actually need? What God says he gives is goodness. And again, God's goodness, well, that's Jesus. For St. Paul wrote this, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own 
mercy. We do not need a show. We do not need the spectacular. We have God's goodness shown to us in the coming of Jesus who saved us, not by our words, but by his power, by his mercy toward us. And yet, what did God do for Moses to his request? God agrees to reveal himself to us. To Moses, he revealed his back. He showed Moses as much of his glorious self and his character that any human being can possibly receive and yet live. Enough to head out on the journey toward the promised land. Jesus did the exact same thing on the Mount of Transfiguration. He gave to those three disciples that day a glimpse of his glory, enough for the journey ahead, the journey to the cross. But it really wasn't that glory that they or we need. It's the goodness, the goodness of God that took Jesus off that glorious mountain and to the cross. For there, there is the truest glory of God in the goodness, the bloody sacrifice for us and for our sin of the very Son of God. Do you doubt God's love for you? Do you doubt His grace towards you? Do you doubt his presence? Do you doubt his care? Do you have questions and demands of God that come from your sinful doubt? And seek God's answer to all of those questions. Seek God's answer for you in Jesus on the cross. This side of eternity, we cannot see God in all of his glory, or we will die. We do see Jesus. The scripture says that he is the image of the invisible God. So see Jesus. See Jesus. See Jesus. See Jesus. And see Jesus. For he is here. He walks with us and he gives us his peace in word and sacrament. So have no doubt. And do not look for false glory. Know God's presence. Receive his peace. And all of God's goodness passes before you in the presence of Jesus, your Savior. So seek him in all the glory of God that we need. All the glory of God that we can handle now in word and in sacrament and in the body of Christ that is his church. See Jesus in these Till that glorious day when we see him face to face. Glory. And enjoy, we can say that. Amen. Enjoy. Now may the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated at this time. We gather our offerings to the Lord. And I ask that you register your attendance in God's house this morning. I sign your name on the pad of him.
Christ our bridegroom, and receive from him the forgiveness, life, and salvation in his holy church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, look with favor upon our Synod President, our District President, our Circuit Visitor, and all pastors in Christ, including our pastors, John Jenkins and Carl Beckwith, that the Holy Gospel would be preached among us in its purity, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, protect and direct all missionaries, including the Lawson and Fetterwoods families, that they would be faithful in their sharing of the true gospel to the world, that those who are lost in the darkness of sin and false hope may come to the assurance of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, bestow your grace on all the nations of the earth, especially our country. Bless those in authority and all citizens, that those who labor in their rightful callings would prosper. Defend us from natural disaster, from war, from pestilence, famine, and every evil. Let useful arts flourish among us and care for our schools, that our children would grow in knowledge and Christian virtue. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayers. Heavenly Father, your Son showed divine compassion even for a groom who ran out of wine. By your Spirit, give us a compassionate heart to notice the needs of others. Support especially today Margaret, the family of Steve, Francis, Pam, Carl, Norma, Linda, Sandra, Robert, and Glenda, Cindy, Charlie, Terry, Marcia, Walker, and EJ, and all of those that we now lift up before you in our hearts. Comfort also the lonely, the depressed, the mentally ill, and all of those who feel abandoned. Let them know you and your son, who rejoices over them as a bridegroom over his bride. Lord, in your mercy. In your Heavenly Lord, grant your Holy Spirit to those who approach the altar this day, that they would receive the Holy Sacrament of Christ's very body and blood in faithful repentance and to their abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord God, Heavenly Father, from the dust of death through the waters of baptism, you take from the side of Christ crucified a bride without spot or wrinkle. Let us find comfort and peace in him, and let us join the whole body of Christ in the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, where the wine of joy and gladness never runs dry. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament found beginning on page 208. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up your heart. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him, being found in the appearance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who gave his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruit of his cross, and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take ye, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And let us go forth in the peace and joy of our Lord as we sing our final hymn for